thanks to all of you for joining us for um, the third of our panels today, um, uh, this time on Pinot Noir. Um, so we've been talking all day about style and about uh, what's new in California and to some extent the notion of, of balance and what a balanced wine is. Uh, and, and Pinot Noir is a very good place to um, to get into I, probably the thick of the debate about um, about California's uh, stylistic virtues and uh, and evolution, um, and the reason for that is that um, what what I term in the book uh, big flavor. Um, it, it's one thing to apply that to Cabernet, which is a relatively robust grape uh, and um, can express itself. Um, uh, in, a, in a muscular way. Uh, Pinot is more complicated um, uh, in that uh, it can be powerful, um, it can also be uh, delicate, it by its nature has a diversity uh, of expression. While I think the view of the New California is that this means that all Pinot Noir must uh, here for be 12 and a half percent never more um, I think that is self-limiting which is to say um, there are expressions that um, that can be ripe uh, and if you can get uh, a big ripe um, balanced uh, which is to say chemically stable innately without having to fix things uh, in it uh, wine at 14 and a half percent 15 percent. Um, then great. Um, I have seen relatively little evidence that people can do that without having to um, essentially undo um, their their viticultural decisions. Um, but I think that's why this. I think that's why Pinot Noir has always made for a good um, touch point uh, for discussing uh, style and terroir. Um, I always like to to throw. Um, one particular quote um, about Pinot Noir in specifically for California, and I think it's a good departure point um, uh, for our, our panelists up here uh, today, who I'll introduce right after I read it, um, which is this. Um, for years, Californians have felt that Pinot Noir should be dark, robust wines in the same style as some California Cabernets or Zinfandels. But Pinot Noirs, in spite of their richness, are not wines of tremendous color or tannin, their style is in their complexity, their subtlety and shading, strengths that we are striving hard to bring out in California. The person who said that was Forrest Tanser, who was the winemaker at uh, Iron Horse, and the year was 1984. Uh, so clearly, um, the discussions that are being had about uh, what California wine should be, what California Pinot Noir should be, um, have been going on for a long time and probably will be for a while. Um, there's some other things, but I think we should get into them in the course of it. Um, so let me quickly introduce um, everyone up here with me. Um, all the way to um, my left, your right, um, Jamie Good, um, whose writings you're all probably very familiar with. Um, and Jamie is going to, um, I think, bring in a little bit of um, global perspective uh, and also some perspective after having um, come out to California for uh, the In Pursuit of Balance tasting a couple months ago. Um, uh, directly um, to his uh, right, um, Jamie Kutch from um, Kutch Wines, um, who uh, I think will um, came out in 0, 05 um, from Wall Street uh, in New York, fellow New Yorker, um, who's migrated west like me, um, and and has I think explored the the full spectrum of. Um, of the state of the art in uh, California, and we'll get to talk about that. Um, directly to um, my right, uh, Jasmine Hirsch, um, who uh, you, I'm figuring most of you have probably tasted um, her family's wines today. Um, Hirsch Vineyards, I will let her introduce, but um, founded by her father, David, uh, in 1980, um, about as far out uh, on the Sonoma coast as you get before you end up in the ocean. Um, and if one believes that Pinot, uh, Pinot Noir functions best at extremities, Hirsch is um, the, uh, um, one of the finest examples in, in California and probably the world. Um, and finally, um, Wells Guthrie of Copan, um, who um, uh, makes extraordinary Pinot Noirs now pretty much exclusively from Mendocino. 
um, but has, uh, both with Pinot Noir and with uh, Syrah and, and other varieties, um, explored uh, and been very successful with um, a, a wide range of California. Um, so why don't we, Jamie, why don't we start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to Pinot Noir and, and also how you came to the style of wine that you're making now. Sure. No, thanks, thanks first for <laughs> introduction and um, I'm glad to be here. So just a touch about uh, my story is I think I came out, in t like we said before, 2005 to follow my dream and make wine. Growing up, I was always a hobby guy. Um, I had performed and done many a hobbies as a child. Um, I think my mom had me tap dancing at about eight or nine years old. So on up, uh, I fell in love with wine when I was in college, when most friends were drinking beer. I would, I would sneak a bottle of Rosemont Shiraz to the party and... and and drink it from a Dixie cup in the corner. Uh, we all get we all get started on Rosemount Shiraz. That's right. <laughs> 1996, I think, was the vintage. It was actually I'd hunt down for that one over the seven. I'm embarrassed to say that. So, I I went on to uh, work in finance. I sat on a trading desk at Merrill Lynch and um, would surf chat boards during the day and came upon. Um, many different styles of wines after work on Fridays or Saturdays. We'd set up dinners with eight or ten guys in New York City and get a back room and, and geek out with 1990 Bordeaux or the likes of, um, I don't even know, 99 uh, Burgundy. So I, my, my evolution of tasting was broad. I really fell in love with California because it was more accessible. Um, the prices were better. Um, I fell in love with Pinot Noir. Uh, Pinot Noir in California really started to boom uh, in the late 90s, uh, in the early 2000s. And I fell in love with one particular wine, and it was uh, a Costa Brown. And it had beautiful flavors and profiles. I wrote the winemaker, and I said, you're living my dream. I wrote a post up on this chat board and said, um, I want to I want to follow my dream and p move west. The, the winemaker, Michael, said, come out, and I'll help you get started. So I started making some Pinot. With him, I made 150 cases, and we're up to about 2,500 now. It's been a lot of fun. That first vintage, the first wine, was 16.3% alcohol. Uh, it was very sweet. It wasn't actually what I liked. I think the first vintage I tasted of Costa Browns was a 2002, and it was a specific vineyard called Kansler, and it was beautiful. It had, it had balance, at least from my, um, my palate then. I think my palate, as all of our palates, evolved very quickly. Uh, but by the time I was getting ready to bottle, I chose the second vintage to really try and extract easier the following vintage and just use my bare feet or my bare hands, thinking that that was going to make the change. The problem was that the pick decision was wrong, so that wine was 15.2% of alcohol. It taught me pretty quickly uh, how important the pick was in making wine. How were those received? They were received well by the wine spectator. I think that was the highest score I had ever received. <laughs> I got 93 points from Mr. Jim Lauby, which um, subsequently from there, now I get in the low 80s, which I'm actually proud of. And I continue to submit because I take it as a badge of honor. <laughs> so, True winemaker's yeah, masochism. Yeah. The third vintage, just, I don't know how much time, I definitely don't want to talk too long. I'm, uh, the third vintage, I tried to pick incredibly early. I picked a full 30 days before the other four winemakers who were sourcing fruit from the vineyard that I sourced fruit from. Uh, I think the wine came out to be 13.2. Again, alcohol isn't everything, and I learned this quickly. The wine was 100% destemmed. I took all the stalks off, and I fermented it just berries. The problem was that the wine had a very light body. It had no weight. And shoulders. If you're familiar with scotch, when you take a sip of scotch, it has glycerin. It sticks to the side of your walls, and it gives an impression of a very long length of a finish. For me, when I had a 13-2-1, I thought to myself, well, this is light-bodied, almost feminine, and it lacked finish. It just fell right off the palate. I thought to myself, I'd love to start to explore use of stem inclusion. Uh, that's leaving the, the, the bunches together with the grapes. That created a mid-palate and a lengthier finish. It gave me grip and structure and tannin in the mouth. If anything, I, 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 I started to fall in love with the wines of Burgundy from uh, Dujac and uh, uh, Romani Conti and Lewa. And these are the wines that were the most exciting for me to taste uh, in, in Burgundy. And my hopes were to explore it in California. I started to purchase dozens upon dozens of old California wines to explore and understand. And 
um, realize what were working and what wasn't. Um, Mount Eden and Calera and Shalone and um, even Hanzel, these had characters, whether they were putting the stems in or just pieces or fragments of the stem was falling into the, uh, the, the tank. They had this incredible aromatic as well as ageability um, uh, to them. So that gave me and set me on a course for making the wines that now I'm making today. It's been fun. So, because yeah, you, I feel like you've studied um, older California Pinot Noir more than almost anyone, uh, often by the most important way, which is drinking it. Um, so it, it, one of the things that was complicated is you sort of named the, the greatest hits, but Calera, Shalone, Mount Eden, um, William Selium, um, but it's a small roster. Sure. Um, so, I mean, what, what conclusions did you find in sort of looking back into the, into the past? Yeah, I found that there's, it's, um, there's certainly, Pinot Noir doesn't give a shit where it's planted. So if the, if, if the vine is planted in Burgundy or the vine is planted in California, it, it's meaningless. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it depends upon uh, the acidity, the alcohol, um, um, the ripeness of the fruit. And it, for all intents and purposes, I think people have a misconceived notion that California wines can't age. Um, and I think that that's a myth. I think that many a wines from California age, can age incredibly well, as good as their siblings across the pond. And, you know, I guess I'm, I'm excited to try and prospect and, and, and hold enough wines back to, to, to show that in the future. These wines that I did source and find and explore, they were magnificent. Um, I've been with, you know, some of the best palates in the world and tasted some of these examples and had them stumped. Um, people who were, you know, drinking, I would say, almost a bottle of Domaine Romani Conti, uh, it seems like weekly, and, and, and they're calling an old bottle of Chalon um, uh, Russo. So it's exciting to, to be a part of uh, trying to see where we can push our limits. And just quickly tell us a little about where Falstaff is and, and just the, sure. the winemaking. Sure. Uh, Falstaff is in Freestone. Uh, it's not a termed, um, it's a town of uh, Freestone. It's not a, I call it a sub-appellation of Sonoma, but it, it's not actual. Soon. Uh, soon, maybe someday. And it's a very cold area. Um, I have weather stationed there, and it's been on record as being a cooler climate than Burgundy, That not that I'm comparing, but it's fun to see that data. Uh, the soil type is, it's a gold ridge. It's the only gold ridge soil type uh, that I use, but um, generally, the Russian River Valley is planted to Gold Ridge. I'm not crazy about the soil type, but it works really well here because it's so cold. Gold Ridge has very good drainage. Um, the vine, you know, has uh, it's a deeper soil in comparison to the many of the vineyards on the True Coast. Um, I think this wine is 12.9 percent. It's 100 percent whole cluster, and um, it's a favorite of mine right now. Yeah, thank you. So. On the possibility that Pinot Noir does give a shit where it's planted, <laughs> um, Jasmine, do you want to introduce us to, to where Hirsch is in the world and, and why it's there? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's really exciting to be here in London and um, uh, to be uh, sharing all of our wines with you, um, but mostly because all of you are here. So thank you so much for your interest in our wines. I know it's. Um, so, or I, I have been told it's a relatively recent phenomenon that this market is uh, interested and has respect for California wines. I think that also speaks to the job that we've been doing or not been doing for the majority of the wines in California. I think California wine is changing dramatically. Um, although, as Jamie pointed out, there's always been excellent examples of wine coming out of our state. But um, really, it's wonderful to see all of you here. So thank you so much. Um, so my father started planting grapes uh, at what is now Hirsch Vineyards in 1980. And um, where we're located, it's uh, called the True Sonoma Coast. Um, the Sonoma Coast is a legal appellation, um, but it's so large as to be essentially meaningless. Um, so we like to talk about the True or the West Sonoma Coast. From the vineyard, from the Hirsch Vineyard, you can see the ocean two miles away. Um, so it's truly coastal. And uh, at the time that my father started planting, um, this was not considered a viable area for viticulture. People told him that he was crazy and that he wouldn't get his grapes ripe and that it was too cold and that he would be better off planting in Carneros or the Russian River. 
Um, a few years ago, Peter Michael planted a vineyard next to us. I guess we've been discovered. Um, but it's really... For significantly more money than you <laughs> Yeah. Well, we were lucky. Yeah. Uh, you know, my father didn't look for a place to plant great Pinot Noir. He fell in love with Burgundy um, in his previous work that he was doing. Um, and he would go to Burgundy a couple times a year as a drinker. Um, he actually received a written letter of introduction from a retailer in San Francisco uh, to domains in Burgundy. It's totally old school. Um, that's how he discovered and fell in love with Pinot Noir. And he bought the property that became Hirsch Vineyards because he felt that California was becoming crowded and that if he wanted to have a place where he could sort of hide out and hear himself think, that he'd better look for a piece of property. And so, um, you know, as John mentioned, you know, we, we bought it for next to nothing because nobody wanted to be there when we bought the property. Um, my father is a farmer, not a winemaker. Um, for the first 22 years of the vineyard's existence, we didn't make any wine. Um, the reason we started to make wine, which was in 2002, was because my father felt that he had hit a wall in his learning as a farmer, as a custodian of the place, through simply farming, and that in order to take it to the next level, we would have to start making the wines as well. Um, but he's still not a winemaker. We have a wonderful uh, gentleman by the name of Ross Cobb who actually lives at Hirsch and makes the wines for us. Um, but we're relatively new to making wine. We've only been making wine for about 12 vintages, but we've been farming for about 33. Um, yeah, so that's Hirsch. Yeah. I mean, we it, still sell fruit. I would say one, one thing I should say yeah. is that, that well before Hirsch was making wine, that it had a significant reputation um, in part through Kistler, in part through uh, William Selyam. And Literai. William, and Literai um, as really being one of the extraordinary pieces of ground in California um, to, to the point of David being a farmer. Um, the, as John's mentioning, the vineyard became known much much uh, sooner before we ever made any wine because of Literai, because of William Selyam, because of Kistler buying grapes from us and putting our name on the label. So it was first known as a vineyard. I meet people still who don't know we make our own wines, but they know the vineyard. So I think it's really wonderful what all of those great winemakers did for the, the name of the vineyard. In, and we still sell grapes. This is the 23rd vintage of the Literai Hirsch Vineyards Pinot Noir. And it's, I think we're really lucky to get to work with people like Ted Lemon and, um, and back in the day, Burt Williams and Steve Kistler. So, um, so just quickly, uh, tell us a little bit about the the evolving style of, of the Hirsch wines, because they've, they've gone through a couple iterations in, in the decade yeah. or so. Um, my father is agnostic to style, and um, when I go for dinner at his house, one night he'll be drinking Amarone, and the next night he'll be drinking Chassagne Rouge. And for him, so long as the wines are speak to the place and are authentic wines, he's happy. I have a very narrow palate. I like a very specific style of wine, but my father really, for him, style's not so important. And when we first started to make our own wines, um, certainly they were uh, riper, but not because we were looking to make wines that would appeal to a critical palate. You know, the dominant critical palate in California for so long has been really ripe. I mean, let's call it what it is. I mean, The Spectator and Parker really, you know, promoted a, a, and encouraged winemakers to pursue a style that, that appealed to a very specific kind of palate, really ripe wines. Um, we were not trying to do that. My father could care less about, about critics. But I think as a farmer, he would rather have erred on the side of ripeness rather than, you know, pick earlier. I think uh, it's taken us 10 years to figure out that we can get more typicity in our wines if we pick <coughs> earlier. And that's why we, our style has evolved, where we do pick earlier. We make leaner wines, fresher wines, but not because we're looking for some style. It's because my father f wants to make the wines that are as true to the vineyard as possible. And we find that with a little bit less fruit ripeness, you have a prayer of making wines that have typicity. When the wines are really ripe, they, you know, they all tend to converge on one thing, which is fruit. Even you can have wines that are so ripe, you don't even know which variety it is. And you step back from that, you say you don't even know where it comes from. So we really want you to be able to taste the place. And those of you that tasted at the table outside, you tasted three different Pinot Noirs from the same vintage from the Hirsch Vineyard, but they're all three different. I think if we had picked them two weeks later, they would all taste the same. So that's, style for us is in service of intention. 
not a means in and of itself. And so uh, just quickly on sort of the, the size and the soils and, and, and also the climate uh, at Hirsch, um, because it is, I, I'm, I'm asking a very quick, I'm asking for a very quick answer to a very okay. complicated question. Uh, the vineyard is complex. Uh, we sit right next to the Pacific Ocean, so we have a maritime climate. If you've ever been to an island, you see that the weather can change quickly. It can be very different from year to year. That's Hirsch for climate. We also have the continental climate when the wind turns. In terms of the soil, we sit next to the San Andreas Fault. It's young land from a geologic perspective. So it's like if you're making soup and you add cream and you have a swirl. That's what our soils are like, except instead of two, we've got maybe 10 but then you've got all different combinations of them. So of soil types, we probably have 25 different soil type combinations, and then wildly complex topography. So you've got aspect, elevation, climate, soil type, and then you overlay man's decisions, vine age, rootstock, spacing, orientation. So it's a, it's a matrix. And would, so two miles from, from, the, from the ocean, would you, would you describe Hirsch as, as the proverbial cool climate? My father wouldn't, wouldn't, but he likes to be contrarian. He likes to talk about how warm it is on the Sonoma Coast. I think it's mainly to piss off Andy Pay, our neighbor who likes to talk about how cold it is. But uh, I think, no, I mean, my father also says, you know, we don't have climate, we have weather. So, you know, in 2011, during the growing season, it was basically 85 degrees Fahrenheit every single day. It was perfect, it was cool. I would definitely call that cool climate way cooler than an average burgundy vintage. But um, we also have vintages like 2008 where it's really hot. The wind can turn around and come from the east and it can be 100. It's not typical, but it happens. So it's really vintage specific. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think also, you know, we've only- and just, Hold on, yeah. if, you, if everyone looks up really quickly, this is Hirsch at harvest. Just for a sense of um, uh, your point about topography and yeah. also, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I hope to answer the question. Yeah, no, sorry, random visual cue. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so, uh, well, so tell us a, a little about uh, sort of where where you where you sort of focused on with Pinot Noir, but also kind of how you how you got to wanting to work with um, the the land that you now work with. Um, Pinot Noir for me was, I used to work for the Wine Spectator magazine, so one of the, the demons here. Um, but I was a tasting coordinator. I never re reviewed the wines, but one of the wines while I was there that I fell in love with were the wines for Ted Lemon. And although he's never received highly you know, high critical acclaim from them, uh, Anderson Valley took out as, at that point, I hadn't made new wine yet. And I, I knew that if I <clears throat> wanted to make Pinot Noir, it uh, had to be from Anderson Valley because I fell in love with. Ted's first vintage was 93. I remember having his, his Civil Wave in your Pinot. And I went to visit the valley. And I was like, this if I ever make Pinot Noir, it's got to be from here. Um, and, and situate us just really quickly on, on where Anderson Valley is. It's about three hours north of San Francisco. It's um, it's in the hinterland. I mean, like, it's no different, I guess, in some sense, just geographically going out to, to Hirsch. I mean, you have to want to get there. It's not just you just hop over there and like you go to the Russian River, you can just pop up for the day from San Francisco, go wine tasting. You don't go to Anderson Valley just on a whim. You have to really want to be there. Um, and it's part of the, the isolation is um, kind of made for you know, easier access for me access at the time to source fruit. There was um, at that time there was you know I was only the second or third outsider from Anderson Valley to come up and start making wine from there, and it was uh, kind of easy to follow on Ted's. Uh, in his footsteps. You know, he kind of paved the way for some people outside the valley, outside of him and William Selliam to come up and start sourcing fruit from some of the various vineyards that are up there and get involved in some of the new plantings as well. And where, where is Kaiser? Kaiser is the, used to be, but it's not any longer, but was the last vineyard in the Appalachian before you get to the ocean. So it's, Anderson Valley is 18 miles long, runs southeast and northwest, and the uh, Kaiser Vineyard was I guess up until a couple of years ago, the, the last vineyard in the Appalachian. So the deep end of the valley, call it its coldest end. Um, Anderson Valley is all sandstone, different formations. Some kind of loosely held beach held together, and this particular vineyard is actually compressed and decomposed sandstone, so more shale-like in its, in its composition. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's about six inches of topsoil, and the rest of it is just fractured, decomposed sandstone. Super cold site. Um, 
all of being as cold as it is because the soils are so shallow, it tends to ripen uh, faster than other parts because a lot of clay in the soils, other places uh, kind of keeps the soil moisture and the, the vines kind of continue to mature uh, slowly. So tell us a little bit about, I, I guess you've, you've developed this reputation for, for having kind of had, a, having a, had an epiphany about um, the types of wines you wanted to make. Um, or, or maybe an evolution. So, uh, you know, how how has I guess specific with Pinot Noir, but but maybe in general, how has sort of your your view of winemaking, your approach to winemaking, changed uh, in over a decade or so? Well, I think you know I started Copan in '99. Gives um, me a back up. I think the common thread amongst everybody, I think here at the table, but also um, out in the room, you've tasted, and other people that are kind of in, in pursuit of balance. There's a common thread of the fact that people hold Burgundy as kind of being the motherland and, and those kind of the pinnacle of Pinot Noir and what has inspired you. At the same time, you think everybody here is like there's a, a lot of introspection that goes on in what you're doing, whether it be Jamie and his style or David talking about, I had 22 years of, of growing in a vineyard, I need to make a change. I start making wine to expand my, my learning. And, and I think for me, it was making wine, thinking that I was making wines that were balanced. And uh, when I got back, I went to work with France for a couple of years, came back, and working for Helen Turley with her brand, Marcuson. And while I was there, I, I thought that that was what, how Pinot Noir was made in California. She was getting all these great reviews from Parker. This is what I was supposed to do. I was picking less ripe because I thought she was picking too ripe at that point, and still making like 14 to five alcohol wines. But what I found is over the years, they weren't maintaining their freshness. They, four or five years down the road, I was like, God, oh, these aren't, Words of vibrancy. I'd, I'd been to Burgundy a few times at that point, and I was like, "This is it's not working." Um, and I ended up having a, a friend of mine who was a small yay and passing away, but we worked on a wine together in the midst of this. Um, and uh, it turned out, you know, we picked a wine. It ended up being about twelve and a half percent alcohol. I went to Burgundy, came back, and I thought it was a thin, anemic wine, and it ended up being this wine kind of blossomed in barrel, put on this weight, and I was like, "Wow, this is really where I needed to go." Um, unfortunately, at that point, I already made our 2004 wines, so we lost all of our wines in 2005 to frost, so I didn't make any Pinot Noir in 2005. Um, Folly in 06 was the first vintage, and I basically did, picked everything, and nothing came in over 23 bricks. So my partner at the time kind of lost his mind because he was, you know, all of a sudden we went from these wines that are a little more open-knit and more plush to, you know, wines that were just barely above 13%, and they, um, we didn't get very good reviews, and we lost quite a few people off our mailing list because they're, you know, the lemmings who were falling points um, didn't want to follow us anymore. So it's been a war of attrition, to say the least. So, so, so were these? I mean, <laughs> did you find that you were able to do this in the same vineyards, whether rather for Pinot or also Syrah? Because I'm sure as folks have been tasting, you make um, a, a lot of very, very good Syrah. Um, did you find that you could get the the same the things you wanted out of the same vineyards, or over time did you have to? Sort of, did you have to find vineyards that would work for, um, for the the numbers that you wanted to pick? At? Yeah, I mean, I still moved kind of at the deep end of the valley. The um, deeper end of the valley is much cooler. It could be 70 degrees cooler during the peak growing of the season of the day, and um, the wine just maintained their freshness more at the the cooler end of the valley. I also we bought a piece of property in Russia River, built a winery there. Um, didn't make any wine off the property. We were selling fruit to the likes of Costa Browns, et cetera. It's, it's a warmer site. Um, but I had this conversation with Burt Williams, and it was you know, the viticultural style that we we have. We followed Burgundy. We planted Dijon clones, vertically shoot positioned, and some of the brilliant wines that Burt and Ed made in the mid '80s. This, you know, this, is, this is Burt Williams from Williams. Thing. Yeah, he, uh, you know, California sprawl heritage clones. It was shaded, and I think that's kind of changed the mindset. I think for me, because the Pinot Noir I try to make off our property, which was VSP with Dijon clones, I would pick the same potential alcohols as I would in Anderson Valley, but just made a thin, anemic, kind of insipid wine that was like, it, it just, there was no shoulders to it, as, as Jamie said. So it just, you can't just arbitrarily go in and like, you know, impose your will on a place that isn't, you're, it's not capable of doing that. So I think what I got lucked out on is that we're able to achieve phenolic ripeness and get good concentration at lower potential alcohols in Anderson Valley and the Dijon clones that have been brought over actually work to our advantage in, in situations where we're in a, a cooler you know, cooler sites in California, for sure. So, Jamie, you've tasted today, but also got an intensive 
uh, in California not long ago and have obviously been tracking these wines for a while. So what, you know, what, what trends do you see, what changes do you see in, in the Pinot Noir that people are making or that, that, are, that are particularly intriguing? Um, and, and I guess specific to what, what also appears in the UK. Yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, back in March, I went to San Francisco to attend um, the, the, the big kind of parent event that this is kind of spawned from, which is In, Pu in Pursuit of Balance, which is, a, a, I guess you'd call it a coalition of like-minded um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay growers who are trying to make... Are any two Pinot, Pinot Noir growers actually like-minded? Well, that's a good question, <laughs> a good point. But um, no, it was, what was fascinating was just going around the room, and there were, f there were more wines than this, there were about 30 producers taking part, is that right? Um, and just tasting all the wines, and everything there was pretty awesome. What was interesting is that these decisions to um, harvest a little bit earlier seemed to be um, increasing the diversity of styles of the wines, whether it be from, from winemaker intent or site, um, terroir. Um, the decision to pick a little bit, bit earlier seems to be working in the sense that it it allows the wines to show their origins, as you alluded to earlier on. Um, and so even tasting around today, I think what's evident is that it's not a monolithic style of Pinot Noir from California. Um, there's lots of different styles represented. And of course, some of that is going to be winemaker intent, the winemaking style, the choices that are being made. But also the site differences uh, are showing themselves um, in ways I guess you can't put a finger on because it's really hard to say this is what terroir tastes like, this is what this site tastes like. I kind of think of it in terms of if you're, if you're a wine grower, your job is to make an intelligent interpretation of the site you have. You've been given a patch of ground or you're buying grapes from a vineyard. Um, your job is to produce a wine that is, is an expression of that, that is legitimate and interesting. And um, I don't think there's any one strict um, um, ultimate final answer from any site. You, know, you can't say this, this is what this site tastes like. I think sites are capable of producing wines that taste quite different but can be quite compelling. Or you can take it too far and you can make a disgusting um, spoofed up wine that tastes horrible that's not a legitimate or intelligent interpretation of that site. So, so what, what, is the, what, what, were the, what have the Pinot Noirs been like that have been available here? I'm curious because I mean we, we get to sit three or six thousand miles away yeah. and dream of Burgundy and, and pay way too much for it um, but I would say at least there's the potential for reasonable access to Burgundy here. Yeah, um, the, the, so far in the UK retail scene California basically doesn't exist at the high end. I mean, there's a very, in the UK re retail scene, you've got lots of very cheap Californian stuff that's pretty nasty and unpleasant. Um, and it's tricked up to make, to make it look like more expensive wine. And generally, but that's, and then you've got this big gulf when you've got the Californian, Californian fine wine scene. Yeah, you, you'll find things like Ridge here, you'll find things like Coupe, um, um, you know, but it's really hard to find and it's quite expensive. Um, so. Californian Pinot Noir, I think, for most people in the UK, is not really on their on their radar. Um, but these sorts of wines could easily become on their radar because, yeah, they're, they're not cheap, but they're not crazy prices. Um, and they're, the best ones, I think, are utterly compelling and are the qualitative peers of anything, um, any Pinot Noirs anywhere, really. I think they're just very exciting. We see a lot of New Zealand Pinot Noir here. Um, because New Zealand Pinot Noir is probably more competitively priced, but New Zealand Pinot Noir, I don't think, hits, it hits lots of highs and I love it, and I'm a real fan of New Zealand Pinot Noir, but it doesn't seem to consistently hit the same sorts of highs as you would have in tasting here, which I think is, is just like going from mountaintop to mountaintop. It's just such a rich diversity of really compelling wines. It's interesting you say you, you, you found diversity at the, the In Pursuit of Balance tasting because it's... Um, the charge has been leveled that those, you know, there is a monotony of a different sort there. I don't think that's the case, but that um, that when you know you have folks who are sort of of that like mind, that um, that you end up with wines differently. But it seems like you that was not your impression, at least. No, and I, I don't think I don't think um, I've heard also people saying, "Oh, it's just a pendulum swing." You know, went for the big right wines and gone to these wines that's taking it too far. And I don't think anyone's taking it too far at all. I think people are picking earlier, and and the wines are working. I don't think there's any sense. I don't think there's any need for a rebound back towards picking a bit later. I think this this, this and I think there's a there's a massive diversity of wines. So I don't think, you know, this is nuts. This idea that that um, 
these wines all taste the same. That's crazy. And I think, unfortunately, that the whole pursuit of balanced things has become slightly politicised in the US. And I think part of that is become slightly because of the reaction from the critics who basically feel their turf is is under threat. You know, they've had this really easy ride so far. With and the, the critics, this is the other thing that really annoys me. I don't. I start <laughs> ranting. So. Brilliant. Is this stupid idea? that it's possible to criticise wine without allowing your style preferences to get involved. That somehow the professional critics are such amazing um, superhuman beings that they can objectively assess um, a quality of a wine um, independent of style, which is like, which is completely, sorry, it's nuts. And I think this is the, the these, these discussions, I think, ultimately become politicised. And you've got wines like the Corazon Cabernet Sauvignon that suddenly has become political wine. It's like, do you like this or don't you like this? If you like, if you like this, you're an evil person who likes thin, weedy, un unripe wines. And if you don't like it, then, then you're one of us. We're reserving it next to yeah. the O3 Pavi. So <laughs> <laughs> it's awful when it's awful when wines become politicised like this because it's cause, you know if you want to go and buy spoofy monster wines, there's plenty of them on the market, and no one's criticising you for doing it. Well, they might be, but um, but you know, it, it, you're free to go and buy what wines you want. But it, I don't think there's any need to rant against a movement where you're seeing these really interesting details pin and noirs like this suddenly emerging um, there's not, it's not there's nothing wrong with that that's really cool so one thing I, I want to sort of put to, to, to Jamie Crutch although uh, to Jasmine and, and Wells as well um, I would argue that probably no grape in the world requires more um, meticulous farming um, and yet we talked about it this morning California is uh, a place where um, having the ability to farm your own grapes uh, to own your own land and farm your own grapes um, is almost impossible for uh, a relatively new winemaker. And so the, um, regardless of style, there has been the rise of, whether it's Costa Brown or anything else, William Selliam, the rise of Pinot Noir is a grape that was unlanded because the people who were making it never had the option to farm in a state. Hirsch being an, ex an exception in the sense that Hirsch now makes Hirsch, but there are also many other people who make Hirsch. Um, but I'm curious from your end, how has it been as someone who has to, who's had to sort of fight to get sure. pieces of land to work with? How, how do you how do you control the things you need to control to get you know, not only ripe fruit but also stems that will work for stem right. inclusion? Yeah, um, I think it, I, this is, I'm going on to my tenth. I think <clears throat> this is on my tenth vintage or eleventh vintage this year. But it took six vintages until um, I gained control of all of the vineyards. Every single vineyard that we source from to have control, control being that we control the farming, that we work with either a farmer or a team of farmers. And, and prior to that, we were purchasing fruit you know, by the ton. So um, number one, that's really important because your ideals uh, are incredibly important. One ideal is for producing whole cluster wine is to limit use of water. I think you could probably have an entire panel on irrigation and how horrible of an idea irrigation is in California. Um, and for stem inclusion wines, when you're leaving the bunches in, if the if the vine is uptaking water and that's going out into the stem, and for all intensive purposes, you're snipping the stem and dropping then that cluster into a tank. If it's had water, a drink, that stem is then leaching out into the wine and giving you giving you a herbaceous or a green flavor. So. For all, again, just to go back, I can't stress enough how important it is if you want to really make the serious wines or the top tier wines that you need to be involved in the vineyard with your vision or your site. Now, even buying by the acre, you still don't have every farmer that wants to work with you and do uh, what you want to be done. Uh, and, you know, I've had, you know, I vent generally on Twitter. I think it was 2011, I just went off on grower after grower. You know, not using their names, but just uh, they like to turn the water on. You know, they're, they're, they're I guess, playing it safe. And, you know, I, I, I want to try and hit the home run. I'm not, I'd, I'd rather not make wine than to play it safe. So, um, you know, it also goes back to con the control of working with that vineyard is you could put a, an assimilation to uh, Thomas Keller, uh, who's a great chef. If Thomas Keller is asked to make a meal and he's uh, in, the, in the test kitchen of McDonald's and has access to all of their food, you're never going to have a great meal, no matter how great of a technique that he has. So it's imperative to have balance and have make great wine is to start with great fruit. And starting with great fruit means balance and great farming in the vineyard. 
and I guess to turn the question on its head, uh, Jasmine, how, how, how does it work for Hirsch? Because um, obviously David has been able to make a succession of decisions about ripeness and picking, um, but he also still has customers who paid him a lot of money for fruit. Um, so how is he dealing with being not only a farmer for himself, but also a farmer for people who make kind of a, a range of wines? I think that making our own wines has made my father a better farmer. And uh, we started working with our current winemaker, Ross Cobb, in the 2010 vintage. And I think uh, that Ross, you know, is for me one of the best Pinot Noir winemakers in California. You know, he's together with these guys. I'm not a winemaker, so he's together with, you know, I think he's extraordinarily talented. And I, I was sort of thinking about the wines that he was making from our vineyard and comparing them with the previous wines. And it's not just a question of picking decisions, it was a lot of other things that were subtly changing in our wines with this new winemaker. And I, I, you know, I work in sales and marketing, so I'm always trying to find metaphors and stories and ways to talk about the wines. And, um, you know, it just came to me that, that a great winemaker, when, when you're working with uh, wine, grapes of terroir, that, um, you know, of which Pinot Noir is one, that, that winemakers are like translators. And if you are in a foreign country and you have somebody who is a native speaker of English and of the language of where you're at, you're going to get a much better idea of what's going on because you're going to have a really great uh, native speaker translator for you. But if they don't speak the language as a native, maybe the interpretation is not as clear, not as pure. And I think it's that way with making Pinot Noir. And I think our winemaker, uh, since he makes wines that are more pure, more transparent, more precise, more uh, transparent to the underlying soil, which of course also means the underlying farming decisions, that it's helped us to see both the good and the bad in our vineyard. It's helped my father to become a better farmer. It's also helped us to realize that certain parts of the vineyard are maybe not as interesting as we thought, and also conversely that certain parts of the vineyard are more interesting. Um, so. I would be careful saying this to my dad, but I think he is a better farmer because we have a better winemaker. So I think it works both ways. And in a difficult vintage, if the farmer is also making wines from the vineyard, then he's going to understand the problems of his fruit customers. So in 2008, when all of our vineyard was affected by the forest fires and all of the grapes tasted like smoke, our fruit customers were coming to us and saying, hey, all the wines are smoky, and we were tasting it in our cellar too. So we gave all of them a discount because we understood what they were facing. And you heard stories from other winemakers saying, other growers who don't make wines were saying, oh no, there's no problem, there's no smoke in the wines. But we couldn't deny it because we were tasting it. So I think, it, I think it's both, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feedback loop. You know, my father likes to say that he grows wine, which is, sounds sort of cute, but it's, it's, it's true, you know? The ultimate feedback from viticulture is the wine, so. And well, just quickly, because you, you, you've sort of gotten a chance to do both, to, I mean, you, you, you buy grace, but you've also sort of taken on the farming in a pretty serious way. Right, I mean, we, when we first started, you know, you're buying fruit, and so, you know, I always got basically relegated, you know, some guy referred to me as the two-ton pimple on his ass, which sounds kind of, <laughs> odd, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, say that because we're basically limited to, to, you know, we're, some, some vintages where you want to pick, for example, um, because you're the low man on the totem pole, you have to wait for winery A, B, C, whatever to pick before you, you end up being three days later, you get your, your fruit picked and that's kind of what happens. So I think the reverse, as you get more control of your vineyard, as Jamie has said, like we're farming by the acre, you know, we own 48 acres now of vineyards. So when we started off with nothing, we've slowly built up and be able to purchase vineyards that we sourced from, that we've liked. They've come up on the market and now we control them. Um, we've converted them from conventional farming into organic farming, which some of them have taken three years plus to actually become, you know, make something interesting. Um, you know, you have the ultimate control, which is what everybody wants from, to make any call you want. So to Jamie's point about watering and things like that, I mean, we can do deficit irrigation like we want to. We don't have to worry about a a grower who wants to go turn on the, the water when we don't want them to, or vice versa. You know, so I think it's, you know, we we get a lot of complaints. I'm seeing comments about us being able to irrigate in California, but I think if it's done properly, um, 
can almost simulate some of the great vintages you have in France because when I was working in the Northern Rhone, like it, it rained all the time, but just enough to kind of keep the vines going, you know, and that's the difference we have is that we, we push it so that we can um, irrigate just kind of simulating Mother Nature as best as possible. It's not the same, but it's, it's something to kind of, a, a, you know, kind of uh, simulate what, uh, what happens in nature. Questions? Uh, thank you all. Uh, today's been magnificent. You've all been very charming as well at the tastings out there. Um, I wanted to ask, especially inspired by what Jamie was saying about tasting lots of wines and at great age, one of the running themes of the growers speaking today, but also John speaking today, is the move towards a, 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 a earlier harvested, higher acid type of wine, which has the potential to age a lot longer, I think. And, and Jamie was certainly talking about the uh, amazing potentiality of, of, of these wines to age in, in this style of winemaking. Um, now, obviously, this is a commercial tasting, so we're tasting your newest vintages. Jamie, you mentioned you try and hold back as much as you can. Uh, you know, Jasmine, certainly the winery's been in your family for, for you know, decades now. You know, you must have some, so you all, and, and, uh, and, and Wells as well, you've been making wines at Copan since 1999. So you've all got a bit of, you know, a few years under your belt. What, what do you consider the optimum amount of aging? I mean, obviously it varies from vintage to vintage, but you know, we're tasting everything you guys have made in the last few years. How long should we be ideally cellaring these things for? Any of you? <laughs> Maybe Jamie first, because okay. it was, you right. know. You know, I, I, I can only go, on, I can't go off my own wines because I don't have the experience. Um, what I can go on is other examples of other vineyards and other winemakers in and around uh, the area. So right now, if we had access to it, 1985 William Selium Rocchioli is no, you know, uh, no puppy. It's I'll a pretty right knockout. Yeah, it's, it, it's outrageous. I mean, it drinks, uh, I, you know, it tastes like it's five years old, not 25. Um, it's 1977, you know, Chalone is an incredible wine. 85 Mount Eden, which is, again, produced with 100% whole cluster, is an incredible wine. So the range is about 25 to 30 years. Um, then again, there's wines that start to have that, like I call it, like the cigar cigar box. They get that little bit of a tired character, and you get that sometimes too. Um, I'd say the sweet spot is, you know, 20 years if you really want to push the limits. I hope that helps. I I wish I knew better on my own. I haven't I haven't a clue. I don't know if that 2012 McDougal will dry out or if it'll be an epic wine in 30 years. I, I, yeah, maybe we'll be around the check. Uh, Neil? Or microphone is coming. I was going to ask, um, do you think in uh, California, has the type of consumer, have you seen a change? Like what I mean is the person 10 years that wanted, say, a Helen Turley Pinot Noir, has that person, is that person now looking for a different kind of style of Pinot Noir? Or is it a different kind of consumer coming in and asking for something different? And also, is um, alcohol is that as, as sensitive a subject in California as it is, say, here in the UK? Um, on the second part, uh, yes, undeniably. Um, I would like a day when I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> um, uh, on the others, I, I'm curious what you guys see, because you, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, where, where your customers are coming from. Uh, I suspect it's a mix, but you would know way better than me. I think the biggest change that you know, I've only been in the wine business for less, less than six years, so I also learn from what other people talk about. But for me, the, the best thing that's happening right now with the American consumer, which is what I spend, I, with whom I spend most of my time talking, so I can't speak to other countries, but is, is the, the growing self-confidence in their own palates, um, which means, you know, yeah, if you want to drink the spoofy wines, drink the spoofy wines. If you want to drink a leaner style, or if you want to drink both, um, you know, not needing the wine spectator or anybody else to tell you what to drink. I think that's the most refreshing thing um, that we're seeing in California. And still using wine journalism to discover new things, to learn about new wines, but also using social media. What are my friends drinking on Cellar Tracker? Um, talking to a, a much better educated and engaged and passionate, you know, sommelier culture within the U.S. and finding wines in that way. And we have some incredible retailers around the country. I just went to Minneapolis, Minnesota, 
and I had my mind blown by the food that I ate and the restaurants that I went, or the wine shops that I went to. You're in Minnesota. It's like, it's not New York City, it's not LA. And I was really impressed with the wine culture I saw there. And I think the, the, the more people taste, and this is true of any segment of the wine business, whether it's the consumer or the trade, the more people taste and decide for themselves, I think the more interesting wine will be because then we'll have a greater diversity from which to choose. You know, wine, wine is, uh, is so personal and it sh you know, I think, so I think that's the best change that we're seeing in the US. Not that scores don't still matter, but I've, we've never sold wine based on scores at Hirsch. Are you getting um, converts from the Marcuson list? So seeing as your neighbors? No, I, I, well... And, and, you're, and you're a bargain? What I, what I always find interesting is when somebody says to me that, oh, my favorite Pinot Noir is Costa Brown and Hirsch. And, you know, no disrespect to, to the Costa Brown guys. They're great guys. Um, but they make a very different style than we do. And I think that just goes to show that the consumer and all of us, we drink wine for a lot of other reasons than what it tastes like. We drink wine because we feel a sense of connection, because we drank the wine in a beautiful place, because we drank it with someone that we love. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, again, you know, there's so much more to wine than just what it tastes like. And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, when I'm trying to sell wine, that I'm never gonna sell it just based on what's in the bottle. You're gonna sell it based on a sense of connection, you know, where people drank it, did they visit the vineyard, do they know you, all that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's exciting, because wine is wine should be multidimensional. It shouldn't be a single dimension, which I think is what scores do to wine, unfortunately, is they reduce it to one dimension. Should we do one more question? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, about terroir, because you're all making the same grapes, so it's really um, a chance for me to ask you something. Can you explain? certain flavors being expressed that are affected by terroir or not, and the vitamins. Well, I, think, and I think there are certain things that are... I know it's a big question, but... I think there are certain things, like there's a vineyard, Heights, Martha's Vineyard, got associated with having kind of this eucalyptus, kind of minty quality, and there were eucalyptus trees planted around. So I think to, to Steve's point, there are, it's like the Guerrigue in the south of France. Yeah. Um, you kind of take, I mean, you down there in the vineyards during the, the summer, and you can smell that in the air. And I think that he's right, and there's volatile oils like settle in the skins. So that's one aspect of it. And there's obviously certainly things that are going on below the ground that, whether it be in Brolo with limestone or same with Chateau Neuf, the same situation. Um, you know, I think it's 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 hard to say because you know California is such a a melange of different soil types. I mean, you have the Pacific Plate subducting underneath the North American Plate, and so a lot of the soils there are kind of this someone, I had a geologist come out and try to look at some of our vineyards and dig some soil pits. And he says, you have like this pudding cake of soils. So it is like to Jasmine's point, it's just this mixed up bag of different soils. And you just, you know, I feel for us having the vineyard like Kaiser, we just got lucky, right spot at the right time. This little piece was exposed and we're trying to find our own dialogue within that going on right now. It's whether or not, you know, I think there's some general things you can say with, for me, at least for the vineyards, we have more clay in our soils. We tend to have more breadth in the wine. I think that's also kind of the case in Burgundy. If you get higher up on the slope, things get leaned out, a lot more limestone. They get harder, like further down the toe of the slope. You get more clay, you get more breadth. And I think that's, for me, that's a generalization with Pinot Noir. But um, you know, I think that's one aspect. Sandstone and Pinot Noir, I don't know if there's any kind of reference points for it. I mean, it's a matter of, I think that Jasmine's point is, the, the wines we're making now are more transparent, and some of the vineyards, like she said, are more obvious. These are better than we thought, and some are like, ooh, this is really, never should have been a vineyard as any wine, and we've dropped some of those. So I think it's, but also, you know, the, the learning curve here is glacial. I mean, we're, I've, this is my 16th harvest coming up, and I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing to some extent. I mean, I don't think there's nothing wrong with the wines. I think it's more just like, the more you kind of know, the more you question about what you're doing, and with that comes, like with her dad, 22 years of farming, oh, I need to change it up to, you know, expand my, uh, my knowledge, you know, and, and hopefully make better wine or produce better fruit for the people that are sourcing fruit from me. I, 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 I'm, I'm curious uh, for Jamie's take on this because I suspect <coughs> from the scientific end, it's curious. One thing I will say is it's really hard to find consistency in a vineyard. Um, and I think, you know, if you're on a burgundy time scale, you can sort of figure out what Volnay tastes like. Um, but, you know, everyone in California has been expected to do it fast, and they've also been expected to do it in a context where 
um, where a lot of wines tasted similar. Uh, and so um, part of it is being able to see variations in the wines uh, and then to be able to do that on a long, long time scale. Yeah, very briefly, um, soils are incredibly important for, for influencing the flavor of wine, but the, the way they have their effect is indirect. It's not a direct translocation through the roots of, of compounds of, of, of rocks or elements in the soil. Um, but basically, all the flavor and aroma compounds um, that you taste in wine are produced um, um, by the grapes or by yeasts through action on precursors that are uh, of compounds that are present in the grapes that have been synthesized directly by the grapevine. Um, obviously, the influence of soil is very complicated and very important. I mean, you've got, I mean, this is one of the big changes I'm thinking in wine science is in recent years there's been this recognition that it actually it's not just the water holding capacity of the soil that matters, but it's the soil's physical characteristics and its chemical composition that shape the way that the wines taste, but it's an indirect effect acting through the grapevine, which is the intermediary. Yeah, I mean, really, until what, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the two opinions on soil impact were um, either it's all about the water holding capacity. If you read any California textbook, that's all they talked about because it was all they could measure. Or this other thing, which you were alluding to, which is, well, it's grown in chalk, and so it tastes like chalk, and it's grown in flint, and so it tastes like flint, which is, I would assert, a bit of a fairy tale. More question? Are we? Uh, uh, I think we we're out of time. Right. Um, although um, our winemakers and John will obviously be uh, be around if any of you do have any more questions, and hopefully you can grab them before the end of the tasting. Um, I just want to say on behalf of Robeson, thank you so much, guys, for for being here. The winemakers and John for coming all this way over uh, from California, and to Jamie for for getting stuck in and being on the panel as well. Cheers, mate. Um, and thanks to all of you guys for, for coming in and spending the day with us. We really appreciate it. So uh, you've got another 50 minutes or so to, uh, to taste some of the most exciting wines in the world. And, uh, and if you do want to place any orders before you... No, I'm not even going to go down that road. Thanks very much. <laughs> Cheers, guys.